All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode. That's right, of the London is Blue podcast. Hopefully your favorite Chelsea podcast out there and a part of the Men in Blazers Media Network. We're celebrating a second league phase win in the conference league. Chelsea getting it done. Jake, hit the stinger, baby. Come hit on. Hit the stinger, Jake. We need it. it against Panathinaikos, a trip to Greece. And Chelsea take all three points. A 4-1 Victory, that's right. We gave a little bit of a consolation prize there because I think at that point we probably just felt bad, Nick. But look, opportunity for us to celebrate, opportunity for us to dig into the fact that Maresca is getting asked crazy questions about having to play the competition in front of you and what that means, talking a how, lot about Mudrick. First of all, how dare he, Dan? How dare he play the competition that's in front of him? That is, it's irresponsible and frankly, it's selfish and I don't like it at all. Yeah, really, really just digging himself a hole with everybody's favorite group of people, the media, uh, and, you know, unless it's that uh, small sliver of individuals who come on our show, which, you know, are generally yeah, loved and adored by the fine. Chelsea community. Look, we're going to get into all of it, uh, a match review, as it were, in our standard format. The quick admin will get done out of the way at the very, very top. And then some three-word match reviews. Look, just thank you, everybody. Sports podcasts. You leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's always appreciated. Mm -hmm. You can hit the bell icon, subscribe, like, and comment on YouTube. Get involved over there. We've got some very specific, wonderful, short-form content you can take advantage of as well. It does not feature on the podcast feed because it's a little more micro size. So you should get involved with that. You can also sign up for our free link newsletter, the London's Blue Dispatch. Sam had a hot one. Right off the presses in this one, we made gave you a real good rundown of some thoughts right after the Panic and Ice Coast match. And then, look, you can get involved in our Discord community in a free or paid way. That is it, though. Nick, run us through some through a match reviews because the vibes were good and the puns were strong because everybody loves an opportunity to take a whack at the pinata or, uh, I don't know, come up with a better pun. <laughs> For the Panath and Icos game, uh... Man, I, my, my Greek brethren, just they, they love a vowel, don't they? Just absolutely love them. Just vowels for everybody. We're just we're doing it. Uh, look, uh, Def Chuck's daddy, longtime friend of the pod, a Greek tragedy. Yeah, yeah, it, it really was. Uh, J Dubs with Unpanicked at the Disco. Uh, the Grick with Played Feta today. Damn right. Uh, Dying Joe one with uh, Greeks bearing gifts. Usually when, when you go to someone's house, you bring something. They were very hospitable to us. That was very nice of them. Uh, Tyson with blues batter baklava. Now, let's take it easy on baklava. That's a delicious dessert that always offers delivers, but whatever. Uh, hemp ends with Chelsea fleece grease. Uh, rhyming always a way to get into the three-word match review. Brent Staben with Misha Does Athens. Matt Fitz with JWoww Laser Focused. More on that in a bit. Mr. George Smiley, 1905, with completing the set, which Dan really is kind of the objective here because uh, I went with, uh, with something kind of similar to old Mr. George Smiley. But for those of us who grew up in the 90s, I know you were a little, a little before this time, Dan, but... Um, <laughs> go to YouTube to see Dan's expression at that joke. Uh, there was a movie called Hercules, um, uh, that Disney put out. It's one of their better, more underrated, uh, animated features. And I went with the main song from that, uh, from that movie, which is go the distance. That's right. Go the distance. Dan, okay. over to you. That's a good one. Look, mine is probably more directed at Panath and Icos, the host of the match, but they let Nike down. It, was be the, <laughs> it is the Greek goddess of victory, mm -hmm. and she was most displeased, potentially, from the performance that they put on in the day. But we're going to jump into this match review again. It was Panath and Icos this past Thursday, October the 24th, as we get very, very close to the end of another full month here for Enzo Maresca and team in the Conference League at the Spiros Lewis Olympic Stadium. The scoreline was Panathinaikos 1, 4 to Chelsea. Very, very good. Joao Felix got a start in the 22nd minute. And then the rest of the goals all came in a much more lively second half of the match. Mudrik in the 48th minute. Felix again in the 55th minute. And Kunku gets his penalty in the 59th. And then it was a 69th minute goal from Pelestiri 
to finish off the scoring in the match. But Nick, why don't you run us through the lineup? Just remind people what was going on with a little bit of a crazy formation shift from Reska, at least on the way it's lined up in paper. It didn't operate necessarily that way in in the formation. It just looks funny on the, the lineup sheet. Yeah, kind of an, an odd one. Some different personnel for this one. Obviously, we heard that there was a standing group uh, of players, including Reese James, Nico Jackson, and others who didn't make the trip, which opened up some slots for some young guns. Like, uh, let's look at uh, Sam uh, Raksaiki, and then uh, Mueka as, uh, as well makes the, the traveling squad, which is just wonderful for them and their development. But the starting lineup, Philip Jorgensen uh, back from the eye injury at international break to uh, to get between the sticks for the uh, UECL uh, league stage. I, I forget the what whole an acronym. Thing. What a yeah, what an acronym. Just the UECL. That's where we're at. Uh, Mark Kukurea, uh, because he was suspended <laughs> at the weekend, uh, is back at left back. Renato Vega making a surprise left center back play in this one that really did feature like, uh, you know, three center backs and, and Mark Kukurea kind of slotting into midfield more often uh, alongside Benoit Badiashiel and Axel Di uh Midfield of Enzo Fernandez as really like the six and then Dewsbury Hall and a floating Joao Felix wherever he was kind of in those like eight tens and then Pedro Neto on the right. Uh, Mikhailo Mudrik on the left and Chris Frankunku uh, as the main striker. Subs of Mark Giu, Tyreek George, uh, Cesare Cassidy, and Carney Chokomeka. Unused subs, Lucas Bergstrom, Robert Sanchez, Tosin Adorabayo, Noni Matawake, Jaden Sancho, and our young guns, Sam and Chimera. So these are, uh, look, w- wonderful for the young guns to make the bench. I would have loved to see them play, obviously, uh, but it was a very comfortable win. And I think. After an international break, Dan, where, you know, someone like Enzo Fernandez is traveling a uh, ton of miles to get back to England, uh, probably a nice little uh, warm up game, reacclimatize himself to, uh, to top tier football. Yeah, when you take a look at the top line stats, Chelsea had 60% of the possession, 2.42 expected goals to the 1.18 for Panathinaikos. We had four big chances to their two, 14 total shots to their eight. We only had to save uh, Colin Jorgensen to save twice. They had five goalkeeper saves on the night. So, again, it could have been uglier for the hosts Mm -hmm. in the day. Uh, they obviously, uh, they had 21 tackles to R7. They had 17 free kicks to R7. Um, you one yellow card a piece. Uh, we had nine shots on target in total. Uh, neither team hit the woodwork. And yeah, I mean, just in general, no random stat. I mean, the, unfortunately, the UECL, as we're calling it, uh, does not have a bunch of reporting around it. But I, I wanted to submit a shithouse moment of the match. And I know typically you like to confine it. I, I'm a rule breaker here, Nick. I'm a rule breaker in this moment because I'd like to take it to what happened off the pitch. What yeah. happened with Enzo Maresca after the game when he gets asked the question or gets a statement rather than a question where he says the reporter asked the, says the statement, Chelsea are not a team of the Conference League, but a Champions League team. And I think Maresca had a really phenomenal response. Like if you could just like imagine him speaking it and, and not me, unfortunately, like this is the problem. Like you're getting me and not getting uh, something with a little <laughs> more gravitas. Maresca with the, can I ask you a question? If we are a Champions League club, then why are we playing in the Conference League? Wham! Followed up with, if we play Conference, then it's because in this moment we belong to the Conference. If the next year or two we play Champions League, then it's because we deserve to play in the Champions League full stop. Great answer. Absolutely phenomenal. Sticks it to the moment. Respects the competition. Respects the people in front of them. And is establishing that little bit of that Chelsea manager aura. A little bit of that Chelsea manager swagger that you kind of look for. It had a little, it had a little Mourinho to it. It did. Some bite. Also, totally unrelated, but equally Mourinho is Mourinho today. I don't know if you saw his his post. He always, dude, he makes me laugh. His his stuff is so obvious when it's going to happen, and he just is unbelievable. I will not repeat it, but go watch the Mourinho clip. He's got a wind up. Yeah, you, you, you look if you're if you're a batter, you know it's coming. He's an all-timer at it. But, yeah, Maresca, a little bit of confidence, a little bit of swagger there. I mean, nowhere near the grandmaster, but, you know, I think this is – it's a good sign. I mean, look, to to be honest with him, these questions 
the constant talk about spending, uh, the the constant you know bullshit that a Chelsea manager has to deal with, you know, despite the fact that they are not making uh, the business decisions at the end of the day, it has to be super frustrating. And I would, you know, for for him to say this, it's one, it's very true because we did not advance far enough in the league last year to be a Champions League team, and two. What the hell else are we supposed to do? Not play in this competition? I like what what does this reporter want from him? I, I guess is my is my question. Like, oh, you guys are too good to be in this league. Do you feel good about yourselves? Like that that's kind of how I took the question. It's like, buddy, I don't make up the rules. I don't know what you want me to do. Did did you ever have a someone in class who had a growth spurt ahead of everybody else? And then like you were oh, playing yeah basketball and like they just had like the extra half foot to foot and at that point it was like it was a very easy i can block a shot or i can post up a shot really easy and like it, it wasn't anybody's fault they're you're yeah. all the same age you're all the same yep. age group but unfortunately mm -hmm. there are extenuating circumstances that are outside of your control and you know some of this maybe could be put on UEFA, like, you know, UEFA mm -hmm. could mm -hmm. construct a competition differently, could build up different structures. But at the end of the day, Chelsea got in to the, the pro, the, into the competition we got into. We should play the people in front of us. We should respect the team that we play and we should play a strong side. And we did all of that. So Mareska did his objective. We got the win. And I, I don't enjoy these questions and I don't think he is, does either. Dan, are you suggesting, uh, out, of, out of bounds, by the way, that UEFA could fix their own problems? No, <laughs> I mean, I would never, never well, thank God. push for well, that idea. <laughs> I just, you know, I thought we were in dangerous territory here. And I was just like, look, we, we know that it's legally not allowed. They can't do it. Do, did not, you have another, did you have another shithouse moment of the match? I'm sorry. I, I, I usurped your regular position here. Uh, I did. Yeah, actually, uh, Mudrick, uh, getting really pissed off at, at Kieran Dewsbury Hall for, for yelling at him when he took that uh, ill-advised shot. We'll talk about Mudrick later, but it was it was kind of a moment for me um, to, you know, I think look at Mudrick a little bit differently, not because I think he's going to turn around and be in every uh, Premier League game starter for us or anything like that, but it, it showed me a little bit of fight and a little bit of bite. And I think for a guy who has been probably down in the dumps and not, you know, super excited about his football, that, that can mean a hell of a lot when you have something to fight for. So, um, yeah, that was, that was pretty shit house for me. And, and, you know, Dewsbury Hall came over and apologized to him and I'm sure they're all friends now, but it was good. Well, we're going to talk all about that. We want to get into, is this Chelsea's competition to win? I think we're going to have some very positive answers there. Chelsea's attack, just how they're getting on. And then uh, maybe some case for it against in terms of debuts moving forward. If there should have been some today, I think there's a lot of questions about, you know, how it's relating to maybe some contract issues in the, uh, youngsters in the Cobham Academy kind of progressing to adult football at this moment. But we're going to get into all that after our first ad break. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right, Nick. So I went, we, we don't talk about gambling often on this show, but I, I did go ahead and just look at the odds to figure out if the markets, if the, the bookmakers agree with my assessment and agree with what our initial assessment, I think, was at the beginning of the season when we talked about Chelsea being in the conference league, that if you're in it, you have to go win it because it would be embarrassing if you don't, which given Reska's questions that he received in responses, I feel like he might think the same way. And I think the club might feel the same way, but we're, we're third. It's our third win in the conference league across all the matches we had our second win in the row. And then second win in the league phase, we've got an eight, two aggregate score line at the moment. We've got a plus five goal difference. We're sitting atop the league grouping at the moment because it's a league grouping. Now it's not necessarily a group stage element. And on FanDuel, we were plus 110 uh, to win. Florentina is next at plus 380, and then Real Batiste is plus 470. We're really plus 110. I thought yeah. we'd be in the minus for sure. I think it's probably, there, there probably is just not enough games that have been played yet because oh, you man. still have four, you know, four more games effectively to play in this round before you finish out. And so maybe they're just saying, hey, look, if something crazy were to happen over the next four, there could be something that happened, yeah, but I, I would expect it to shift pretty quickly to being in the negative because our next couple of matches are playing against the fifth place team in the Armenian League, the ninth place team in the Bundesliga, the third place team in the Kazakhstan Premier League, and then the third place team in the Ireland Premier Division. I'm just saying, and I want to put it out there, 
that my view has not changed. And I'm actually more emboldened at this moment to say, unless something catastrophic were to happen, Chelsea is raising this trophy at the end of the season. I don't, and yeah. I don't think that's crazy. I don't think it's crazy no. to say it. No, I mean, I, I think I was a little less bullish at the beginning of, of the season when we did our predictions because I wasn't sure how quickly this team would pick up Maresca's ideas, and I wasn't sure how certain players would look, to, to just be candid. I think that the way that Maresca has organized this group to have two different 11s so that players are getting consistent playing time. I think the way that each 11 has performed on average, you know, there are some blips in there, obviously, um, you know, losing to Servette away was not great. You know, drawing to palace at home was not great, but like by and large, I think both 11s have played pretty well this season. And I just, I looked at Panathinaikos as really like the, you know, maybe, you know, Heidenheim will be the toughest game in our league phase of this competition. But like, I thought Panathinaikos might give us a little bit of trouble. And it was like somehow easier than the first game. And, you know, it was like 15 minutes of like kind of some tough physical football. And then, you know what I what I saw out of this one today, Dan was, and I don't know if you feel the same way or not, but the way that we're possessing the ball and the way that we clearly set up the rope a dope for Panathinaikos to want to press our back line and our back line easily finding midfielders, our midfielders finding attackers, attackers slotting home goals. I just think the gulf in class is going to be too much at the end of the day. Um, yeah, Fiorentina, it, it, you know, any, any given day, like a, a, a you know, Serie A team could easily win this thing, right? No, no question about it. La Liga team, maybe. You know, I don't, I don't think Batiste is really that good. Uh, but this was the first game this season where I looked at the 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 actual movement of the football and it changed from potch ball to Maresca ball. Ooh. The transfer and power has happened. It's it's happening. It's it's it took a minute, and I would argue that like e potch ball was largely fine with me. I like the excitement of it and like I like that we scored goals, but the the command and control that the team showed today after the first 15 minutes, I mean we were we were toying with them. You know, like Batty Shield legitimately at one point in the second half. No, it's in the first half. It's in the 35th minute. I just got done rewatching the first half. Literally put his foot on the ball and put his hands on his hips and waited for the Panathinaikos attackers to come and get the ball. And then he slotted it to Enzo Fernandez, who carried the ball through no midfield presence whatsoever all the way uh, out and made a terrible pass. And then we lost possession. But, like, it was that easy to gut them. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, you know, you're right. Like, unless something catastrophic happens, injury happens or something really terrible or or the vibes just completely go out of the room, which, by the way, as Chelsea fans, any of that is possible. <laughs> any of that's waiting right around the corner for us. Uh, I, I just think the golfing class is too much. The, the players yeah. are too good. Uh, and, you know, you're going to have different iterations of this back line. You're going to have, you know, a different midfield combo sometimes. But... This this lineup is good enough to win this thing pretty handily, I think. Yeah, and you know, so just from a, a contextual point, I think you touched on a couple things there that I think is interesting. I think one the start of the season and how we're getting on. I mean, just to you know, if we were to win the conference league, which I think you and I are in agreement we are going to do, it does guarantee and admit you know Euro Europa League football for next season, which you would argue we should qualify for Champions League football based upon league position because that fifth spot UCL is looking very, very good from a coefficient standpoint. But on the positive side, Dan, I can make Europa League stinger again. I think everybody wants to hear that, yeah? Uh, everybody is yep. really looking forward to it. Yep. 
The thing, though, that was probably most critical and I think is the reason why we're going to continue to be comfortable in this competition, you know, I think you watch this game and for large phases, I think we were unfazed about the attack coming at us. We were not concerned about the opposition that we were going up Mm -hmm. against. It's almost as if it's the, you know, the fighter is just in a different class than the person going up against them. And the punches and blows are just happening at a little bit of a slower speed. They're not as polished. They're not as well presented. And again, you're playing a competition in front of you. So like this does not necessarily translate to us going out and absolutely dominating Newcastle over the weekend or even in our League Cup mm-hmm. match we've got coming up. That is just different, different competitions different altogether. But we had 11 different starters from our last match. The two 11s, which we have talked about, which has been something of lore in this podcast. Like you can go back years. We have talked years. about this idea of two 11s. And this might be the first time where we actually can do it because we have this ridiculously oversized squad that was really criticized heading into the end of the transfer window, heading into the fact that we were stranding players, we were destroying careers. And now Chelsea had the benefit of saying, look, Mareska, you can take 11 players, you can swap them out. And so now when you go play Newcastle on Sunday, you can have a completely different side. You know, look, all five of the subs who came on in the Liverpool game did start this match. So like there is not necessarily like a complete handover, like just because you featured in one game, you're not going to necessarily feature another. We know players like Cole Palmer, Nico Jackson, not necessarily involved in the conference league at this point. So like that is something that kind of keep in mind and consider too. So like, just in general, like that to me is the biggest reason. Like, it's not even the fact that our player class and quality is so much better. Our infrastructure is so much better. Like, it's, it's It comes down to infrastructure. We have fresh players who can rotate in. And so all of these teams that are also playing their league and don't have as deep of a squad as Chelsea are going to struggle to match, match that over the remainder of this competition. Yeah, I mean, we just have, we have more and better resources. And more often than not, that's going to help you get over the line. I mean, I I do think the way that we're playing though and starting to evolve a little bit is, is interesting. You know, it's a team that has shown a lot more confidence in the system than I anticipated them having at this point of the year. Um, And, you know, again, you got guys who haven't been over performers over the last two, you know, one to two to three years throw Batty Shield in as an example of this, who are starting to play with some confidence and some swagger. You know, you have a guy like, uh, you know, I, I would look at Mudrick in this way. I would look at, you know, someone like Pedro Neto, who's, who's at a big club for, for the first time in his career trying to get acclimated. I'd look at, you know, Karen and Dewsbury Hall, who's, you know, very much the same. Look at, you know, Renato Vega, Philip, I mean, these guys are, they're, they're not, it's, it's not a lock that we're playing this well, just because we have talent. I think they are starting to play well. And, you know, I, that is one that has to be heartening for the whole group Mm -hmm. when you go into training to know that everyone's going to get a fair shake. You know, very few players are going to be isolated, all that sort of stuff. But two, the, the best Chelsea teams that we've ever watched, you know, the teams that have won things have been deep and talented and pushed each other the entire way. And, you know, there were, there were moments where your John Terry's and your Drogba's and your Lampard's weren't favored under Benitez, right? Like there, there have been moments where your big names haven't always been the ones that carry you through. So, you need these guys to play well. You need these guys to not only for this competition, but for the FA Cup and and the festive fixtures when we were playing two or three league games in a week and and you know really pushing ourselves. Like it's it's gonna get hairy, and you're gonna need a Benoit Batty Shield to show up ready to go and not be you know flummoxed by the moment. This is it's mission mission critical if we if we want to do all the stuff that we say we want to do, right? That the team and the ownership and the sporting directors have said they want to do, which is get back in the Champions League, win a bunch of stuff. And that's what needs to happen. Maybe sign a Jordan brand deal too. Like that would also be just a, and and get a front of kids sponsor. 
Yeah, a bunch, sure. bunch of things that we still have to check off the old uh, to-do list, as it were, De- never seems to get smaller in size. But one thing that's continuing to grow from a numbers perspective is the attack for Chelsea. And you wanted to talk about players like Mikhailo Budrick. We could talk about Pedro Neto. We could talk about Jay Wow himself, Joao Felix, and then look and Kunku still getting involved as well. I mean... It just has to be Mudrick first, though, right? Like, we have talked about Mudrick this season. I think we had kind of earmarked him as, like, if you had to maybe move on an attacker, like he was in the, you know, falling behind Nani Medaweke because of Medaweke's strong preseason, uh, how he ended last season. And, you know, I think he's kind of proven maybe at this point he's probably the better suited individual for the Premier League at this time. But to have a player like Mudrick building some confidence, building some comfort. Still very much, I think, a developmental player. And Enzo Moresca, I think, called this out afterwards he, in his post-match press conference comments. He said, I'm very happy to see Mudrick in there, in that position, scoring that goal. Mudrick's learning process is more slow compared to other wingers, but he's improving. And so, I mean, I think, like, look, it's not necessarily, like, 100%, like, the biggest praise, the most full-throated endorsement for the player that you've ever seen. But, I mean, highlighting the fact that, like, he is still a player who has opportunity to be successful in world football, to be successful at a top level, to be successful, particularly against this level of competition that Chelsea's playing against and should do nothing more than to give him loads of confidence. I mean, one goal and two assists might end up being one of his best performances in his entire Chelsea career at at this given point in time. Yeah. I mean, you you noted the hundred percent pass accuracy, the duels, the chances created, three chances created, two shots, two fouls, one, two assists, one goal. These are, it's better. I mean, it, again, I think a couple things to note about him, you know, he, I don't, I don't think we understood when he was purchased how raw and how unfinished he was going to be. And that in and of itself, you know, I think has caused everyone to reset their expectations. I have not, been the biggest fan admittedly and i and i i don't i don't i'm not one of these people who's gonna be like hey buddy i was there for you the entire time like you think everyone on this podcast knows that i'm i'm fair about these things if i'm right about something i'll gloat if i'm not right about something i'll raise my hand and go hey i was wrong about this i i don't know who this player is yet i'll be completely candid but the take-ons were good today the fire was there there was real fire in his belly the passing was much, much better than it has been, especially in the final third, where, you know, I think that has been a huge problem for him, uh, as we've seen before, where he just doesn't quite make the right pass. And yeah, he hit the header with his eyes closed and wasn't sure where it was going to go. Who fucking cares? It's a goal. It counts. Like, you know, these sorts of games to me are the games that, if he eventually becomes a regular starter at Chelsea, you will look back on to go, ooh, I I remember when he decided to really turn it on and play as a part of this this group instead of as an individual by himself. Like that to me is a it's a thing. And yeah, man, he's still a relatively young player. He's still a pretty raw player. But if they do take their time with him, and I think that's what Enzo Moresco was saying. Yeah. Here's a real blunt style to him uh, on the on the chit chat after the game, but I think that's what they're saying is we're taking our time with this guy. We're not mm-hmm. we're not going to put him in a bunch of situations where he's going to fail and fail and fail, and that's going to deteriorate his confidence and all that sort of stuff. That to me is the smart way to do this: take him out of the limelight, help him build up, help him build that confidence, get him in training, let him have some success, build on that success, build on it next week against Newcastle in the cup. Right. Like there, there are opportunities coming up that are not going to be cakewalk opportunities where you're going to have to really show up. You don't think that Newcastle wants to beat us in the cup next week after we beat them last year on that penalty shootout? Hell yeah, they do. They want to come and beat us. Are you Mikhailo Mudrik going to do what you did in that game last year and show up in a big way? Let's see. Yeah. It- so it is his best individual performance with three goal contributions in a, in a match for Chelsea. 
I mean, that is just, you know, I went back and looked as you were chatting here. So that is a a, a highlight night for him. I think makes him, yeah. in my mind, the player of the match for, for Chelsea on the day, you know, running away with it in this regard. And, you know, puts him a point where, I mean, look at it, you know, Chelsea, you know, for Chelsea, his highest total goal plus assist contribution was nine in 41 matches played, 23 starts, 2,000 minutes last season. And so now you take 263 minutes, uh, six matches played, three starts this season. You take the two he already had, you add the three, we're at five. So he's five to nine. So he needs four more to match the total that he's had in his, uh, you know, first mm. full season. So like, this is just like, you're talking about progress. You're talking about development. You're talking about growth. Great for Mudrick to have set the stage here. I think we want to talk a little bit more about you know, a bunch of the other players. We've obviously got Pedro Neto getting some minutes and opportunity. We have, you know, J Jay Wow uh, getting some opportunity as well to be involved in the attack. But we're going to get the last ad break out of the way. And when we do that, we'll be right back after this. So stay tuned. All right, Nick. So just on the other attackers, any other comments you want to call out? I mean, I think, you know, Felix had some good goal contributions in this one. Really enjoyed getting a chance to see him get involved. I think Neto's continuing to show some promise and, you know, really looks like he can potentially make a good return on the investment that Chelsea made into him. I, again, I don't know how much you can take away based upon the comp level other than just like, hey, they did a great job and they're continuing to get minutes, they're continuing to build fitness, they're continuing to be you know, potentially great replacements if someone in the first 11 were to get injured like that, that to me is like, the, like that's what I'm hoping for at this point is that they're, they're getting enough confidence that if something were to happen at the top, top of our kind of food chain, that those underneath them are kind of ready to go and be involved. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I would say for, for Felix, if, if you're going to play as fast and loose as he plays, you better score. Um, and you know, I think not only did he do that today, you know, two, two pretty good finishes. Um, you know, so he was definitely putting on a show with some of the skill moves. Positionally, I, I don't understand what he's doing uh, for most of the game. Maybe that's a me problem. Maybe it's it's a Nick Verlaney problem that he doesn't understand what Felix is doing in the buildup. There were times where he would drop super deep and get the ball and try and get involved in the game. There were times where he would stay up top and almost play as a striker when, you know, Nkunku tried to drop deep and take some of the Panathinaikos players with him. Um, he's an interesting case study. You know, I think he has so much more freedom in these sorts of competitions to, to flex his muscles and do the sorts of creative things that I think he's been longing to do for a long time that like uh, let him have some fun with it. But I don't think positionally he's adept enough to play Premier League football regularly is kind of my analysis. Nothing against the dude just based on the competition that he has, which is basically Cole Palmer and Christopher Nkunku in that number 10 spot. I, you know, hard to see. Um, Pedro Neto, I actually did not love his performance as much today. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a guy, um, you know, and I, I like watching him play. I think that, you know, his directness and his left foot are not to be trifled with. He is definitely a skillful player. He's definitely a quick player. Um, yeah, I don't know if he's quite as fast straight line as, as Mudrick is, but. No, oh, he's, absolutely he's, not. He's, he's not slow, though. I mean, I. I them in a race would be interesting for sure. And, you know, he's definitely putting on, I don't know if you've noticed this, he's putting on some bulk because I think, you know, there, there is a, there's been a concern with him in the past just because of his stature that, you know, when he starts getting injured, the injuries kind of pile up. And so having a little bit more bulk, being able to withstand some of those uh, more aggressive challenges that he, he was seeing is good. Uh, obviously the assist is excellent. Um, and it was perfectly placed. He loves that ball. And my hope is that other left wingers who are playing when he is playing, make that same goddamn run and hit the back post and are ready for that because it's going to be there. Uh, it's a wonderful ball. His performance on the whole was fine. It was okay. To me though. And, and this is just the, you can have a really stinker performance and your performance can kind of be meh. Maybe is the way that I think you're grading it on the Nick Villani scale of yeah, uh, fine. adjectives yeah. to describe yeah. the performance. He gets an assist on the day. Mm -hmm. So now he's up to four goals plus assists across all competitions. He's played uh, just around 500 ish, just over 500 minutes Four, you know, five 
uh, five starts across all competitions, 11 matches played. He'll have had four goal and assist kind of total. He had 13 in all of last season for Wolves. And that's his best senior season. So he is almost 31% of the way. Trending to on the right, yeah. It, trending in a great direction. And again, mm -hmm. you can argue the comp, you can argue who it is. I mean, like his contributions have come, you know, against Ghent, you know, I, I, against Panathinaikos, you know, and against Barrow. So like he's not scoring against the cities and Liverpools when he gets potentially an opportunity. So like that is something that needs to improve and change. But when he's being called upon, when he's being involved, he's finding a way con to contribute. And, you know, I think maybe just to kind of tack, tack onto the last attacker here, uh, Kretu and Kunku for getting laser beamed and finding a way to score <laughs> the penalty. Boy, oh boy, that, that guy can't face yeah. it. Yeah. I, I, I will say this, uh, credit to Joao Felix for, for not fighting for the penalty. I think we've seen instances of the penalty shenanigans, and that has not happened this year, which is good. Um, I'm almost a little bit surprised that Nkungu didn't let him take it for the hat trick, to be candid. Um, but, I mean, there's I have so few doubts when him and Cole Palmer stand over the penalty spot that the ball is going to oh go in the back of the net. I mean, it's like... There were a few seasons ago we were like, you know, the Jorginho hop, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? And it was always kind of like tense whenever we would take a penalty and like they just go up and hit the shit out of the ball. <laughs> like I, I, I just love it. it. It might be a little old school vibes from me, but just go and hit it hard. And it's the He's odds are in your favor. I don't know. His, the last time he missed a penalty was October of 2022 when he was still playing in the Bundesliga. So his record is 12 converted out of 13 attempted. Pretty good. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, he's injured for most of 2023, but whatever. I mean, you can only take the penalty shots you're yeah, given, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Look, I mean, I just, I, I think he was kind of aimless today. Like I, I think was doing a lot of selfless running, but maybe wasn't getting into the game as much. Wasn't on the ball very much today. Maybe that was intentional from Panathinaikos, but it was, it's hard to say that because I don't think anything about their defensive structure was intentional, or if it was, it was intentionally bad. Um, you know, so it's like I think Mudrik and Felix definitely had the better day than than Neto and Nkunku. But if you're looking at the grand scheme of things here, Dan, and, and we're kind of talking about this team and 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 what we do, this is another four goal game that we've had this season. Yeah where two of our attackers, I would argue, even though they got a, an assist and a goal respectively, didn't have phenomenal games. Where Enzo Fernandez almost scored a screamer, right? Like, th th this, is a, this is a very, very, very good thing. You know, I, two seasons ago, the ball would not cross the line into the net for anything. I, I don't even know how many goals we've scored this season, but it's probably... Yeah. Okay. So we're six goals off or whatever it was of the, of two years ago, Premier League and it's October 24th. So may the free scoring days at Chelsea remain. Uh, and if we can do it without every single one of our attackers having a 10 out of 10, yeah. then even better. I mean, we, we have only failed to score in one match the entirety of the season. So like that is just a, example of the fact that like we are finding a way even in the multiple games that we've only got one like we had one against liverpool we had one against forest we had one against bournemouth we had one against palace we had one in that loss to servette that weird 2-1 fixture where we're like oh we're, we're fine so we're just gonna like take it off now um so every other game three four 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 five six multiple games multiple fours of five and a six that is really, really confidence building as a supporter, mm -hmm. as a player, as a manager, as a footballing organization, that you have something that is working. And hopefully it continues into the weekend fixture we have against Newcastle, the weekend, the midweek fixture we have against, surprise, Newcastle, and then the <laughs> upcoming matches we have against other Conference League competition and Premier League competition. But I think that I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the fact that, you know, there were academy players on the bench. I think there were questions about debuts yeah. versus not debuts. 
I, I'm of two minds of this, Nick, and I want to lay out my case and then you can kind of come at me with your thoughts. I understand the desire to get it, get a player an opportunity to get an opportunity to sub in. My only concern in this match would have been, even though we're, we're up three, you know, we're, we're kind of cruising ahead here. We're feeling comfortable is a lot of these players are the next individual up in a couple of positions for this, for the senior team. And a lot of them don't have a ton of minutes yet this season. Like we are, we are still very early in the season. We still have a couple players like, Dewsbury Hall, who are, are still trying to get back into, I think, match speed. You know, you have players, you know, like, uh, you know, Renato Vega, who's like, okay, well, like, where are you going to contribute this season? Like, how are you going to be involved? I mean, maybe players like Mark Cucurea could have been potentially pulled off, but, like, I feel like that signals that we're going to do the Malo Gusto Reese James show again uh, against Newcastle in the weekend. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think that's true, by the way. I think uh, well, Cucurea is the starter. J- j- just, just potentially projecting yeah. something out there like that, that maybe that's like i'm trying to kind of make a case for it but like i get the desire to get the the individual kind of opportunity in there i feel like the moment like is going to be not maybe like the third or fourth game when we have like a we will not finish outside of the first position like we will be locked into the number one spot within our conference league group fi- like league phase once that's happened, I feel like we're going to see this in droves. But I, I do think it's a shrewd approach. It's very not. It's obviously not kind to necessarily, but like winning is the objective here. And like, I, I don't know. I mean, like you you got George in, which is great. Like you got yeah, you know, he was, obviously he looked good too, and he looked good, he looked really good. You, I mean, Cassidy has some some value. Like we've wanted to say Chuck Omeka for a long time. So like I, I get. Like you could have made one more substitution, and so like maybe you should have tried to find a way to get one of them on. But I, I just you know I, I I feel bad. I I but I can see I think where we're trying to get to, and and can make a case that like yeah it will it will happen. Like we're we're clearly trying to find a pathway for these players, and unfortunately it can't, like it's not going to be like three or four every game. So. I think the only counterpoint I have to that, because like I think you're right, like the, the amount of mouths that there are to feed is is significant. A lot of players, you know, Karn's getting on today it was such a pleasant surprise. You know, Ty getting on, pleasant surprise. Really excited about that. You know, but I think where my head is at, you know, on the on the counter of this is that you're cruising in this game. The academy guys coming in are not going to hurt you in this moment. And it's at the very moment where you're trying to showcase not only to them, but to other notable Academy players who we will talk about in a second, that there is a pathway to the first team. Right. And just being on the, on the bus is, is fine. You know, getting on, on the, on the plane to Greece, you know, nice little, couple days in Greece. Cool. But playing football for Chelsea football club is how you convince these guys to not go to Liverpool city, Real Madrid, wherever they're going to go. And in these moments, you know, do, do you need, you know, Mike Margu to do, do we need to see him in this game versus one of them to make a point? I don't know. Right. You, you can also make the argument that maybe this is ahead of schedule for these two, right? Maybe we're at a stage where you know, this you know, even getting on the bus was a big deal to them and, th- and they feel great about it. I don't know. But as, as we move to talk about, about Josh and, and um, you know, his situation, I, I do think for these matches, especially the matches where we are, winning handily where there is literally nothing that is going to change the result. The only thing that will change is the feeling of pride for this young player achieving their dream of playing for Chelsea. There is no downside to that. And it's incredibly important that you facilitate that pathway to the first team in in a meaningful way. That's, that's my only push. Yeah. And and I think this, 
has a brighter spot on it. And I think maybe to kind of provide context to, you know, maybe those who are not paying as much attention to the day to day or the news outside of what happens in the match. But we had Matt Law, a friend of the pod, reporting out there that there is a bit of a standstill on Josh's contract extension. That, you know, again, it would be his, uh, you know, senior contract because like he turned 18 back in May. So like this is his opportunity to get like that real like first pro senior deal kind of put together that would be like a longer term contract extension. Um, you know, ultimately you know, he's got 18 months left on his current contract, but it's apparently he is not going to be playing for the first team or the development side until it's resolved. And I, this was kind of what added a little bit of at least online commentary kind of concern and question around our, those youth players, those academy players getting an opportunity in matches like this um, from off the bench, even for a cameo of a couple minutes, just to say, hey, like, here's an opportunity, right? Like, you can point to George, but then you also can point to the other two guys on the bench and say, like, well, yes, you did, but then also you didn't really fully. And it's just an odd period. I feel like we are still trying to find value to find ways to get our academy players involved where we can. I also think we've invested a ton in the side and there's going to be, again, to your point, there are so many players looking for minutes in this side. There's so many players. And it's, I just, it's a good, good and bad problem for Enzo Moresca to figure out and hats off to him for trying to do it as best as he can in this moment. And, uh, you know, there are going to be Academy players who are going to churn out and look for opportunities elsewhere. They're going to be Academy players who bet on themselves and stick it out and take a loan and see what they can do. I mean, we, we, you talked about it with, uh, you know, Justin Nath. We got players like Andre Santos who'd be like, boy, oh boy, it'd be great to have him as a midfield option for Chelsea Football sure. Club at this given moment sure. in the season. Like, I don't know. It, it, like, it's like shaking a magic eight ball right now if you're an academy player to figure out like what your future is. Yeah, and, and look, Aki Bong is is a real player. Like, there, there is, there is no doubt that City, Liverpool, Real Madrid, Barcelona. You know, the names that you kind of see most associated with a player of that caliber. There's no doubt that those are real, right? Like, this is a guy who is a real talent. He is the next guy. He is the next guy to come through. Um, You know, Ty obviously has now done it a few times where he's had some minutes, got a lot of looks in preseason. Josh got a few as well. I, I don't know why the contract wasn't signed or what the, you know, Every, every side is going to have their story on this one and they're going to have to figure out kind of how to figure it out. But this is a player that if, if, if Chelsea are serious about not just going to buy players, but, but really developing players and you bring in this new, you know, I, I would encourage everyone to go listen to the Academy special that was done uh, two weeks ago they, where they talk about the new structure and, and there's looks to be some serious investment in, in the youth, you know, just as there has been for, the last 25 years, like this is a guy that you have to figure out this season, how to involve. You just have to, you have to do it. And, and really this is now the strategy coming to a head on, on a pure volume play with guys like Andre Santos, with guys like Josh Aki and Bong, with, you know, some of the more talented youngsters that we have coming through and all these loans that we have, where do they fit? Do they fit? How are you going to ensure that they eventually do fit? It's not just monopoly money. Hey, let's go buy everyone under the sun. It's how do we use them? How do we use them appropriately? Where where are, the, where are they best suited? Right? There's no reason that Josh shouldn't be playing for this team in this competition or the League Cup. There's no reason. Period. Well, we- we will see how Bresca and the team, the organization, figure out how to get them involved. Again, I think it is going to be very, very tricky, and it's going to be a balancing act. And we'll see if this contract resolution can happen between now and January with the clubs you, know, you mentioned potentially being interested in taking up an opportunity if you know, uh, Josh were to be available and to were be kind of discontented with where his Chelsea future was, he could wind down um, to the point where Chelsea don't feel like they have an opportunity and would be forced to sell. But look, I, I want to talk about the fact that we're, you know, we're the, the only other thing I got as an item of note 
is to Saucy, apparently, is one yellow card away in the Conference League uh, from a one-game suspension. Three yellow cards in the league phase equals a match ban, and uh, across both games, he is the only Chelsea, Chelsea player to be booked. Wow. So our, our, our discipline in a non-PGMOL <laughs> era of football, very good. But uh, boy, oh boy, this, um, you know, uh, it would be fine to lose to Saucy for a game if that were to happen. But hopefully he can. That's uh, why you have result. Josh. Bam. <laughs> there you go. Minutes and opportunity. I mean, Nick, though, we're atop of, uh, of the league phase table. Six points alongside Florentina, Liga, Lugano, uh, Victor- Vittoria, Hearts. Uh, man, we, we the top six. It's tight. It's it's tight. There's uh, multiple teams. Nine teams on six points at the moment. Yeah, we're we're only up on goal diff by one goal. So which is fine. We have we have a five goal difference. Fiorentina, Legia. Lugano, I'll have a four goal difference. And then you move down to, you know, three, two, whatever. We're the best team in the competition. I have no doubt we'll finish on full points. You know, this this match in Heidenheim were kind of the two that I was most interested to see. How does this work? You know, we, we have Heidenheim coming up on November 28th. So just a little over a month away. We'll we'll see, but I again I feel pretty confident in the standing. I feel pretty confident in the way the team is starting to play. And and you again, I would just you should feel good. Look at look at the passing from this. Go rewatch this today. It started to a lot more vertical, quick passes, a lot of runs, a lot of some sexy stuff happening out there from a passing pattern perspective. Well, watch the second half. You could leave the first half unwatched. Uh, leave, leave that on red and. <laughs> I rewatched the first half because the first half actually I saw the transition happen after the for I think it was like 25th minute. Yeah. They started to really do it. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so yeah, a slow transition, but I think they're really starting to pick it up. Oh, look, that's gonna do it for this episode, but we're gonna be live again on YouTube on Sunday after the Chelsea Newcastle match. Hopefully it'll be a little bit more upbeat and celebratory than our live stream after the Liverpool match. So join us on YouTube for that one. And then look, we got plenty more content coming your way in the following week. There's a Newcastle midweek match. There's a Man United match the following weekend. So plenty of stuff that we're gonna have to preview and review. And we hope you will join us for it like, subscribe, hit the bell icon on YouTube, get involved in our Discord in a free or pay capacity, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.